theme of a conference is speed. And um, speaking of speed, Senator, it, it's hard to think of a more daunting set of foreign policy challenges uh, uh, that the next president will face. I believe that the most urgent attention right now needs to be given uh, to the fact that um, we are not in the process of reducing the number of nuclear weapons either in Russia or the United States. As a matter of fact, there have not been negotiations quite apart from the possibility of treaties uh, for the last uh, six years. And during this period of time, we now face the North Korean development. Uh, India and Pakistan ha still have weapons, and from time to time over Kashmir have some words. Uh, there are all sorts of possibilities uh, in development of those weapons. But I was impressed uh, last week when I attended Nuclear Threat Initiative board meeting. This is started by my partner, Sam Nunn, former senator from Georgia. And around the table there, there were Russians, people from China and uh, Pakistan, and quite apart from Europe and so forth. And uh, they were talking just not only about nuclear weapons, but uh, by uh, the ability of nations now to deploy these weapons uh, to submarines, uh, to other places that uh, aren't pegged where you can hit them and know where the target may be in the past. And furthermore, that both nations seem to be, and this is a distressing fact, at least that I feel, headed toward trying to sort of modernize the weapons. That is to make them much more effective, even if they're no more than the ones that we now have as warheads. Um, I, I would add to that problem the fact that um, we have the, the problem of, of warfare now in which we are, are knocking out each other's communications. We're, we're tapping them, but we're developing ways in which you could cause a shutdown of institutions, of perhaps of cities, of, of hospitals, of, of so forth, a different type of warfare, to say the least, electronically. Uh, and on top of that, finally, we've been reading about the use of drones. Uh, drones right now are very useful by the United States in doing reconnaissance and doing intelligence work to find out where things are and what they're doing. But the developments that we're doing, and our people admit that others may very well be doing the same, is to create drones that think. And by that we mean uh, drones that actually uh, uh, do not require to being turned on by somebody being given instructions by somebody, having uh, at least a, a format of what to look at, but with drones that could act independently. Uh, this is known sort of as a Terminator drone po possibility. That is drones that act almost like human beings but have the ability to kill people. Uh, this is something that's not really out there, but uh, our people say in 10 years, you might be able to develop the Terminator drone. Somebody else does it in some other country sooner than that. I, I mention all of this because uh, we are in, in a process of developing in this country and our competitors, whoever they are maybe, in other countries, all sorts of awesome ways in which life can be made not only more unpleasant, but, but uh, finally terminated, literally, for many people. Well... These are important questions and and um, and serious ones. And I, I did want to I did want to get into the issue of nuclear weapons, uh, um, not only because of its importance, but because of your unique role. Uh, the senator was uh, mentioning his role with um, Sam Nunn, the Democrat from Georgia, and of course there's legislation that bears their name, the Nunn Luger legislation, which was developed. Um, uh, after the end of the Cold War to deal with uh, loose nukes uh, in the former Soviet Union and uh, other weapons of mass destruction and even some conventional weapons. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's 25 years uh, next month uh, from the, from the uh, initiation of that legislation. So sticking with the theme of speed, uh, in, in, the, in the dark days of the Cold War, keeping nuclear weapons on a hair trigger 
was a feature of the Cold War nuclear standoff and seemed to be essential for the credibility of deterrence and for uh, 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 absence of, uh, of the use of nuclear weapons. And that kept many uh, people in the Senate, U.S. government officials, and ordinary Americans uh, up at night uh, thinking about it. And uh, my question is, um, what is the risk, Senator, uh, that we will return to that kind of a relationship uh, with Russia? Or do you think we're already there? Or do you think the risks are different? One of the aspects about the so-called 40 years of mutually assured destruction, and this was a period in which both the United States and Russia had over 8,000 and perhaps as many as 10,000 nuclear warheads that were aimed at every vital military target in the United States and at all of our major cities. And uh, somehow or other, a mistake was not made for 40 years. It was remarkable. We got to, to a period of beginning to think in 1986 about arms control for the first time, treaties to begin to reduce the numbers, which we have been doing subsequently. Uh, but um, in those days, by and large, the weapons that Sam Nunn and I looked at as we were trying to, to help uh, bring about the termination of the Russian warheads, which came down from 10,000 to 1,550, which is a big difference over the course of 25 years. But, but we could tell, we could target them. We knew exactly where they were located. Uh, and the proposition I was opening up with tonight is, uh, what if, in fact, most of our weapons were in submarines. Um, the Russians haven't developed a submarine fleet quite comparable to that. Uh, but um, Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, has suggested, for example, that we ought to get rid of our nuclear weapons that are on ground level, that uh, are on bases that are known to the Russians or anybody else, and that all of them ought to be deployed in submarines or, or other uh, movable situations. Uh, now, that then leads to real problems of decision making if you're president of the United States. Um, in the old days, the, the thought was that you would have uh, 15 minutes um, and you'd be woken up at night and uh, told, uh, and, and you wouldn't know really whether it was a mistake or not, and therefore whether you ought to fire away and so forth. Um, I, I suppose the thought is that, if, as Bill Perry has suggested, if we have these weapons at, at sea and they're unknown, you can't really target them, then this is a deterrent in a way, um, and, and, and they're going to be more useful. The, the difficulty is that uh, we're on the threshold, as I see it in the Congress, of having a debate as well, to whether to spend in the next few years about a trillion dollars to perfect all of this with the few weapons that we have left. And um, this, the Russians will not be able to spend a trillion. Um, so what will their reaction be? And already we're seeing with the, the idea of this Russian flotilla trying to come out of the Arctic uh, and around Europe and into the Mediterranean and so forth. Um, somebody with, with uh, imagination that uh, trying to say, you know, we might be able to develop some things too. We might be able to counteract whatever you're doing. And, and finally, you, you leave by inside the Russians. Here you have the uh, young leader in North Korea with the development of his nuclear weapons and, and deliberate uh, discussion by him that he's trying to develop a missile with a small warhead, nuclear warhead on the end of it, that could get to California. And, and there's no, no absence uh, there of, of daring or of, of Guile. Um, now, he hasn't got there yet, but if you're in California right now, you wonder really, is this for real? Uh, and if so, how can it be stopped? And thus far, our economic sanctions, even with various other countries trying to help, have not deterred this at one bit. And, and do you think, uh, with respect to North Korea, that um, the, the previous idea that we could work with China uh, to uh, dissuade North Korea from continuing to pursue nuclear uh, ambitions, that that, that that course is that's what it is. Well, I fear that um, 
North Korea has ambitions right now, and this is very topical, that President Park in South Korea is in real political difficulty because of an aid that uh, she entrusted in leaving aside all of the interplay there. The fact is, this is not a pleasant time for uh, South Korea. It's a situation in which the North Korean leadership feels, as a matter of fact, the vulnerability of South Korea might be such that they could entertain the thought, really, of uh, making one Korea, but the North Koreans being dominant in this situation, and uh, continue their nuclear developments uh, in the process of all of this. Uh, they have some confidence the Chinese will not intervene, because the Chinese do not want any part of North Korea. They do not want a flood of people coming across the border. They've gone to great extremes to keep everybody there in North Korea. And at the same time, the, the Chinese do not have a great deal of affection for South Korea as it stands, and the United States position there. We've had troops, as you know, since the Korean War. Uh, South Korea is very important, as is Japan a short distance away, and Australia a little farther away, and so forth, in terms of all of our Pacific strategy and our pivot idea. So the, the, the Chinese uh, might envision the fact that if uh, somehow the North Koreans cause trouble for South Korea, uh, that's uh, not uh, going to be a difficulty for China. But there's, there's leeway there. I, I wanted to ask you about one more uh, important uh, dimension of uh, the effort to uh, slow the spread of nuclear weapons, and that's about Iran. Um, you know, diplomacy, and particularly arms control diplomacy, is about buying time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't solve the problem, it may be enough to, to buy time and then and then, and then political developments yes. may, may, may change the circumstances significantly. Uh, you supported the um, uh, agreement with Iran, um, uh, effectively trading sanctions relief uh, for limitations on Iran's nuclear program. Um, for the non-experts in the room, or maybe for, for some people who are skeptical, can you, can you uh, uh, explain to people uh, why you think that this agreement was, uh, was important to support? First of all, it was important to know that not only the United States was involved in negotiations, but we were uh, together with Russia and with China, with Great Britain and France and Germany. This is quite a group to pull together and a, a very important factor, really. And uh, the group negotiated with Iran, saying that in essence, a, a, a nuclear development is not acceptable we are all going to continue to impose very harsh sanctions upon Iran, upon the people of Iran. And as a matter of fact, uh, the sanctions were hurting. They were effective. Um, so the negotiations finally came down to the point that um, we felt we could get a deal, not permanently, but for 10 years, maybe 15 if all worked out well, with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, uh, with inspectors in Iran, uh, we negotiated for the removal of a large portion of the uranium that uh, might come into nuclear. Uh, we stopped altogether uh, uh, other m methods uh, in caves or what have you, uh, and I can't often memory, uh, remember all of the facets of it, but the, the net effect of this was to stop the program. And uh, the question, of course, is, as some skeptics would say, well, we've been almost through a year of it already. You only have nine to go. <laughs> what uh, happens then? Good question. Uh, it, it's still probably not going to be in Iran's benefit. Iran is prospering because many of the sanctions have been lifted. Even United States firms are doing some business with Iran now. The hope there is that there is a government of Iran that is interested in outreach to the rest of the world. Not the Ayatollah Khomeini, but, but the, the elected government. There could be, because there's such a young com composition of the population of Iran, people who really don't want to be in warfare permanently. They don't have the same view of, of others in the past. This may be uh, too hopeful, but it's progress much more so than we've come with North Korea, for example, that we were just discussing. 
And, and Senator, I think you made a very strong point about the fact, and it may be underappreciated, that this was uh, an agreement that was not just between Washington and Tehran, yes. but included the permanent members of the UN Security Council and the EU and Germany, who had been united in imposing sanctions, mm -hmm. quite stiff sanctions, over a long period of time against Tehran, uh, which brought Iran to the negotiating table and produced this result. It's a significant example of what diplomacy yes. can produce. Back to a more general question, S Senator. You, um, you were in the Senate for 36 years, and during that time, you saw a lot of change in the world. Uh, and looking back, at, uh, at certain times, some of that change seemed surprising. Uh, on November 8, 1991, uh, even though there had been reforms under uh, the uh, Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, I don't think anybody expected the next day that the Berlin Wall would have fallen. So it, it, seemed, to, it seemed to all of us to have happened somehow quite suddenly. Um, this was also then followed by waves of a democratic change and a democratic movement, another wave of democracy uh, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but in Latin America, in East Asia, places, both places where you were very deeply involved and a real champion of democracy, and you readjusted American Cold War policy to support democratization in those places. So again, our theme today is speed. How did this change look to you at the time? Well, there was real speed in the change in Latin America as we moved toward democracy. Uh, fortunately, uh, once the El Salvador election was concluded, and that was the first one, at least in a row, almost all the other uh, nations in Latin America began to have uh, feelings that they ought to have democratic elections. So some of us were on a team that went to observe these elections, not to interfere, but we were on hand uh, to uh, really commend the country, uh, to be helpful if we could. In, in providing uh, uh, situations in which the election might be a better one. That is, how do you print ballots? How, how do you distribute uh, them and how do you count? What do you do with illiterate people who need maybe signs of animals or what have you to find which party is which and so forth? It was a very exciting period of time and it led to much stronger ties between the United States and these new democracies and the new elected leaders. Um, we went through almost every country except for, for Cuba with an election of this sort. Uh, and this, this came prior to the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. But that uh, really uh, started an interest in the Senate in 1986. Not the breakup, but the thought we might begin to talk to the Russians about arms control. And as a result, President uh, Reagan realizing he would need a two-thirds vote in the Senate, a very strong bipartisan majority for any treaty with Russia of the former Soviet Union, asked that uh, 16 senators go to Geneva, Switzerland in the summer of 1986. I was fortunate enough to be among them. Uh, it was quite a group of Bob Dole and Bob Byrd, who were the leaders of the Senate then. Ted Kennedy was there and Al Gore and my partner Sam Nunn. And, uh, it was quite a time. Uh, Ted Stevens, late Ted Stevens of Alaska, felt so strongly about it, he in fact rented an apartment. He was going to stay there throughout the negotiations. But this was not to be the year. Uh, at that time, Sam and I visited with a lot of Russians over their consulate. And these are people we got to know better over the course of the next uh, five years. And uh, cutting to the chase in 1991, at the time the Soviet Union was breaking up, some of these Russians came to Washington. We sat in a round table in Sam's office, and uh, the Russians started by saying, you folks in the United States have got a lot of trouble ahead of you. And so I said, well, what do you mean? And uh, so they said, well, uh, in essence, we are having desertions by some of the soldiers who are guarding the nuclear weapons that are aimed at you in the United States. <laughs> and uh, it could be an error, it could be a mistake. After 40 years, of, we didn't have any mistakes, but they're, they're stealing the, uh, the materials and all the rest of it. I said, what do you need from us? He said, a lot of your money, uh, first of all. 
but we may also need people who are technicians that can help take down the missiles and take the warheads off the missiles and begin the denuclearization. Uh, we may finally even need some of your troops. We don't know really how things are going to work out. So this, this really was the beginning of the Non-Luger Property Threat Reduction Act. And it, was, uh, it came about literally uh, because an invitation by some Russians to help in their denuclearization. It's, a, it's sort of a, an impossible thing to imagine, two great powers for 40 years, and one comes to the other and has this conversation. Now, I, whether the Russian leadership knew all about this, I don't know. Our leadership certainly was very skeptical. President Bush you know, had almost the feeling, I'm commander in chief, you guys, none of Luger, are, are little guys back here in the Senate, you know, but uh, nevertheless, we proceeded, got $400 million that President Bush could spend, took some of his administration back over, and we all got religion together, going through Russia and Ukraine and so forth, seeing the troubles that were there. Um, I mention all of this because um, sometimes things occur in the world you could never have anticipated, but you have to be ready for them. And uh, thank goodness uh, we were ready for this one because it made a huge difference then in our relationship with the, the Russia that came along, as well as with all of the other countries who felt threatened and still do to this day for that matter. How would you compare uh, the pace of change then and the surprising changes to how you assess the global circumstances now and the pace of global change? Well, I, th I would say the pace of global change right now is very fast. Uh, without going through all the examples of this, uh, take, for example, the Philippines. Here we have a, a great ally. Um, now, for a while, the Philippines wanted us out of Clark Air Force Base, but after a while, they decided really it was pretty fine to have Americans around, and uh, many more began to return. Uh, th throughout um, the last presidency of President Aquino, Corazon's son, we had a very good relationship. The Philippines grew substantially. Now suddenly, uh, out of the blue comes uh, a mayor of a, a city down in Mindanao. His uh, great passion had been the destruction of drug dealers and cartels and everybody else dealing with that. Been very effective at it. Uh, we've taken a position in the United States that uh, even people uh, that he's after ought to have some due process, there ought to be some rule of law. He disagrees very sharply. And uh, so sharply, as a matter of fact, that he was discussing uh, the disposition of Americans leaving the Philippines, the ending of the uh, normal naval exercises that we have. Uh, and having the Philippines having won under President Aquino a law of the sea court case against China, um, he dismisses all of that and said, I think maybe the Chinese are the people that I want to talk to. That is, that is speed. <laughs> that is huge change in a very short period of time, to say the least. Um, now, we've had uh, a, a quick change um, in terms of trade situations. As everybody has read, I suppose, in the papers the last few days, the world trade as a total amount has diminished over the past year. Chinese doing much less trading both ways. Um, we've been unable in our Congress to move either of the major trade bills. Uh, this is disappointing to our Asian allies who are, are trying to avoid being signed up by the Chinese in a competitive maneuver. And with regard to the Europeans, uh, we still are in hassles over agricultural policy. So that's not moving. And most predictive won't move, whoever wins the election in the lame duck session. But this is um, a big change in the world. If we have a diminishing amount of trade in the world as a whole, uh, the effects of this upon all the people who are counting upon um, food, basically, or any other thing to stay alive, uh, they're not in good shape. Um, we are, we are likely, likewise, to lose out in terms of the intellectual content that has come, really, from this world competition. It's not a, a situation of guarding all of what you have. It's a question of, in fact, exporting, getting new friends, new allies, new ideas, dealing with other countries. Um, 
you know, it's, uh, this is the hallmark of what the international school that you're the dean of is all about, that you are teaching at least 70 or 80 different languages uh, so that we are able to communicate with people all over the world and hopefully uh, to deal with them intellectually and business-wise and so forth. Well, th thank you for the plug. We do teach 70 languages at the school. Um, uh, you, 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 did, you did mention uh, trade and um, the fact that the two, well, both presidential candidates, uncharacteristically for uh, a, a presidential campaign season, are opposed to the trade deals on the table. It's a very unusual circumstance. Can you say a little bit more about why it's nonetheless important to go forward with, with, with global trade and global trade agreements, and in particular the the, 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 the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and uh, the, uh, the TTIP agreement for uh, a free trade agreement across the Atlantic. Well, it's been noted, um, Lee, that not only in our election but elsewhere around the world, that a degree of so-called populism has really boiled upward. Uh, populism frequently means that uh, a group of people in a society feel that trade is diminishing their jobs and their prospects, and they don't really want any of it to do that. Worse still, uh, they, they also take a very hard line with regard to immigration. Whether there are, are people who are at risk around the world or for any reason, uh, uh, they have been much less humane about this. It's not just the case with many Americans, it's the case with people all over the world. We've had, a, I think, uh, with the Brexit vote in Great Britain, um, an example of this, uh, an astonishing vote, really, but at the same time, uh, one that has great implications for Europe. Uh, there are predictions that many European countries may want to have Brexit-type votes and vote themselves out of the European Union. Um, so this is a, a period of time in which, uh, hopefully, uh, we will gain some confidence in what we are doing, that uh, we think that it's competitive, that we would like to export. Uh, let me just take one very small part of this. Uh, I'm, I'm a farmer because my dad bought a farm in Indiana in 1930, and he passed away 50 years ago, so I've been managing it for the family. 604 acres of corn, soybeans, and hardwood trees. Now, I, w I read the ag newsletters every day about uh, agricultural trade throughout the world. Uh, because uh, the, the fact is that we're having another huge harvest in this country this year. This follows a huge harvest last year. It's imperative that we export a lot of this uh, grain, soybeans, wheat, corn. Uh, the Chinese are buying a lot, That's thank goodness. The Argentines and the Brazilians didn't have a very good year because of bad weather and planting problems and so forth. So we've got to break that way. But just uh, uh, farmers in Indiana have a great stake in moving their grain and moving their products. Now, around the world, uh, the people who are going to consume this have a big stake in staying alive. Yeah, you, you've still got maybe 500 million people in the world uh, who are on the borderline of starvation even as we meet tonight. And this is a huge problem for all of us in a humane way. But it comes, comes down to the fact you've got to keep the trade going. You've got to keep the ships moving, all the infrastructure that's a part of that trade. Do you think there are broader consequences for American leadership in not being able to approve a treaty which the United States was the main proponent of and the main uh, negotiator uh, of? Well, it's a very embarrassing incident, and it leads then many people to say that uh, we're in gridlock or the Congress can't move or whatever. Um, no need to describe it in all these sorts of ways and throw names. And so. We really just need to get on with the fact that as a part of uh, the job of being a, a senator, a member of the House, quite a part of being president, you, you need to formulate a budget you need to think each year. We used to have authorization bills in the Senate, in which first of all, you start out the beginning of the year, sort of set the stage for what we need to see in agriculture this year, or in transportation, or in the Interior Department. They didn't have an appropriation bill that uh, picked up those ideas, assigned dollars to them, or, or 
remove them, as the case may be. Uh, this has almost collapsed to the point that there are, are very few authorization bills, perhaps the defense bill occasionally, or veterans affairs. But um, essentially, we get to the appropriation side. Most of those don't pass either. And then we get to the continuing resolution and the so-called kicking the can down the road scenario each year. And even, even then, it's not clear sometimes that you're going to make it unless you have a special session of the Congress devoted, really, just to keeping our own budget alive. Oh, this is uh, not a good way to run the country. Uh, granted that um, many people feel, well, this is the leverage that I have, using a filibuster in the Senate or various devices in the House. Uh, I have certain things on my mind, and I'm going to stop the whole train if I'm not uh, given what I want. And if you, if you develop so many members with that kind of a mindset, um, obviously it's not going to be easy to do. So this leads then to questions about so-called executive authority. Uh, does the president then do the legislative job, really, by simply mandating certain things and hoping he's not overturned by the court system or by somebody in the process? Uh, yeah, it's, as, as you say, it's, it's not a way to run a railroad, and it's also very corrosive to uh, uh, the United States' ability to, uh, uh, to show any global leadership and to push uh, global enterprises that it believes are in its interests or promote uh, its values. Um, I have to ask the inevitable WikiLeaks question, um, which I'll, I'll try to frame in keeping with our, th our theme today. In the past, leaks of government information uh, usually came through the media. Well, by which I mean things that were called newspapers, uh, where there were editorial standards. Maybe you agreed with them, maybe you didn't, but there was some set of standards by which an editor would make a decision and try to evaluate whether certain information uh, is worthy and important for the public to know about for one reason or another. Um, now, of course, that information uh, comes uh, occasionally through newspapers, but more often uh, from individuals who have a variety of uh, uh, motivations, sometimes public-spirited in their own judgment, uh, sometimes from uh, foreign governments whose motivations are unclear or may be suspect. Um, uh, how do you view the significance, the impact of uh, this unmediated uh, uh, threat at any time of a leak of sensitive information about the conduct of our foreign policy and how it affects our ability to um, lead in the world. Well, it's really an awesome threat. Uh, and um, I'm hopeful, as I suspect you are, and everyone in the audience tonight, that we're going to develop at least cyber techniques that, uh, if not immune to tapping, uh, at least come much closer to that. As it stands, we have, as you point out, the newspapers, but so-called social media, and then really all of the interaction of people using their computers or their iPhones or what have you, uh, making statements, Twitter statements, all this type of thing going on all over the world. and. And then uh, people, uh, it's like the WikiLeaks uh, situation, uh, sort of um, working from the, the benefit of uh, an embassy uh, abroad, um, doing this tapping and siphoning and breaking and so forth. I'm convinced that, that um, almost anything that I would put on my computer now in a message to somebody is, is very likely to be uh, taken up by somebody if they're that interested. I don't think what I'm writing would be that interesting to people, but I would just have to take for granted that uh, it's as if I were shouting it out in the front yard or the, to the public generally. Um, that, that This won't work inevitably. The mistrust and the, the degree of difficulty created by all of these divisions um, is, is awesome. And we're going to have to develop really better means of communication that uh, are not as vulnerable. And apart from improving our defenses and the security of our information, 
Uh, how do you think about deterring or responding to foreign uh, cyber attacks or interference? Um, um, do, do you see an, an analogy between the arms control world or um, uh, do you think that we ought to respond in kind? Do you favor instead the approach that the Obama administration seems to be taking, which is to uh, arrest people uh, in third locations who happen to be on vacation from Russia who are believed to have been involved in some of this hacking? How, how should we be thinking about this foreign policy challenge? Well, I think that we ought to hold responsible uh, people who break the law, but it goes beyond that. Uh, I, I was talking earlier in the evening about uh, making drones almost like persons. You know, this, we're, we're going to have to get into a very different kind of cyber situation than we have now. What we have now is very vulnerable. All sorts of people uh, can break the law uh, day in and day out. And if you were, there's no court system in the world big enough uh, to prosecute all these cases. It's, it's the technical aspects of it that are going to have to go on. Now, I, I'm sure, even as we speak, many people are working on this because from the same way of our own defense, it's very vital that our defense department have the ability to communicate uh, without having interception. Um, that, that would be very desirable for each one of us, as a matter of fact, if we were just in business or conversing with relatives, but it's, it's absolutely vital right now for the defense of our country. I had the misfortune uh, in 2010 of having my cables leaked uh, when I was serving overseas, and um, it, it was, fortunately it was only six months worth of my cables, uh, but it was a very, very awkward cir circumstance talking to your um, counterpart, yes. uh, in this case the foreign minister of Poland, and telling him uh, what to expect mm -hmm. as these um, cables unfolded. Uh, and it, yes. And it also, uh, and it hampered your ability to do what you're paid to do, right. which is to report back to your capital about how you see things, how your colleagues are interpreting things as they're out there uh, doing the nation's business. So it's, 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 it, it's, it's, a serious, it's a serious challenge. Well, I'm told now that um, we have uh, some time for questions for the audience. Uh, ask any questions that you may have. Uh, please wait for the microphone so that we can hear you. And so, as this is recorded for posterity uh, and put online, uh, if it's not already hacked, um, to, um, to uh, be brief and direct uh, with your questions. Um, if my aging memory serves me, um, Senator Luger was a mentor to Senator Obama and a foreign policy advisor to him. And when Senator Obama became President Obama. He tried, he, he attempted to put three Republicans into the cabinet, two of whom refused outright, the third of whom Senator Luger wanted to, but it's my understanding that he got a lot of uh, pushback from Republicans that it was un American for a Republican to serve in <clears throat> the administration of a Democrat. And if uh, you would speak to that. Well, let me. I'm, I'm happy to go to the next question if you want. <laughs> indicate that um, Barack Obama came to the Senate and served on the Foreign Relations Committee as one of his first choices. He was the junior member on the Democratic side. And as you go back and forth in the question of witnesses, he would be the last one called upon. Often this was two hours or two and a half hours into the hearing. Sometimes we were the only two people left, as Chairman and, and, and Barack. And so one day uh, I commended him for his diligence and his interest in all of this. And he came back and said, he says, Dick, I, I, you go to Europe and you go to Russia particularly every summer. I'd like to go with you this time. So I said, well, that'd be fine. So make a long story short, Barack uh, joined me in, in going out to Russia and we had all sorts of problems that we were uh, held at one airport by the Russians who thought that we, I was a spy and they were trying to get on the plane and so forth. But uh, it was a rough initiation for Barack in Russia, to say the least. But nevertheless, uh, 
he enjoyed this in Ukraine and, and um, other countries as we proceeded. And when we came back, my, um, he um, indicated we ought to offer legislation. So we offered what came known as the Luger-Obama bill, which really dealt with um, conventional weapons that had been left over from world wars in the past and so forth. Uh, this came back in a different way when Barack Obama ran for president. Uh, he, he was asked, uh, Senator Obama, what have you ever done in the Senate? What bills have you ever been responsible? Oh, easy, the Luger-Obama bill. This is in the first debate with the Republican candidate, and oh my goodness. Then, then, then in the same night, uh, there was uh, this reverend in, in Chicago, to whom you may some remember, that uh, supposedly had an influence on Barack Obama. He said, I pay no attention to the reverend. If I want uh, financial advice, uh, business advice, I call on Warren Buffett. If I want foreign policy advice, I call on Dick Luger. I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> Hit twice. Well, I was flattered, but uh, make long story short, uh, I was not an advisor uh, for Senator Obama or President Obama. Um, we have been good friends because I admire the work that he has been doing, but uh, I was never asked to be a part of his cabinet, and so any rumor to that effect was is simply wrong. And, and notwithstanding that fact, there's, I think there's little doubt that um, uh, the influence of uh, Senator Luger, the, the, his uh, willingness to take uh, Senator Obama with him to, to Russia and to involve him and show him about the deep work he had done on uh, uh, limiting uh, loose nukes in, in Russia and elsewhere had a big influence on uh, President Obama's uh, priorities and his efforts to uh, successful in one case to negotiate an agreement to reduce strategic nuclear weapons uh, with Russia and uh, and to pursue uh, nuclear proliferation. Well, more he broadly. won the Nobel Prize uh, by, by that speech that he gave really about the world without nuclear weapons. Uh, I think he ends his administration very sad that things have not moved in that direction. But nevertheless, it was a very important speech and a very great recognition of him very early in his career. Then. My question is about the future of the Republican Party, um, even though we don't have an hour. Um, the, uh, the current platform and current and upcoming leadership uh, seems to be getting more conservative, not less, um, and representing less people in this country. You know the effects of which personally pretty well. Um, is there a p possibility for change? And if so, um, how would that occur? <laughs> I think there is a possibility for change, but I think that uh, there will have to be at least a change in the mood of the public as a whole. Uh, the the anti-trade feelings, the anti-immigration feelings, all of this, um, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it does arise from a large number of Americans who feel left out, that somehow or other uh, time has passed them by, and that life is unfair. Uh, they want a candidate who says, I want to sock it to him without knowing who him is, it's that type of thing. I, I th think we have to evolve out of that, but it will not be easy. And uh, it will require at least candidates who finally uh, are prepared to talk across the aisle. We've started our so-called Luger Center, this uh, bipartisan index idea, which we rate all the members of the Congress and the Senate from 1 to 100 members of the House, 1 to 435. Those of you interested in how they all rank can take a look at our Luger Center website and print it all out. But to make a long story short, we're looking for how many times somebody introduces a bill and gets bipartisan co-sponsorship, or how many times somebody reaches across the aisle to co-sponsor something of the other party. And um, this has attracted at least some discussion around the country in newspapers and journals and others asking about their congressman or congresswoman, how are they doing and what are they doing. But it's, it's, a, it's a beginning, really, of a conversation that has to occur in the Congress if we're going to be more successful in the Republican Party, because to take the position simply that I'll shut down the Senate um, is a position that uh, at least one senator has been taking from time to time, but uh, it's not going to be good for our national security or for the party or for anybody else. I was wondering how you could best explain the Republican nomination of Trump and what that means for the future cycle of presidential elections. 
Well, I get back to this, and, and this is an generalized analysis, but and I think that um, the Donald Trump candidacy appealed to many Republicans who feel left out in America, who really wanted somebody to be a champion of their, their grief and their wants. Uh, and um, we can all say, well, my goodness, uh, this is no way to run a country, but this is a democracy. People uh, you know, throughout the world, really, are having these sorts of elections. If you take a look at many of the European elections just this year, the people winning may not have been Donald Trump-type figures, but they were people appealing to the same block of voters in their countries that uh, Trump has appealed to in winning the Republican nomination in this country. And um, I, I would just say that uh, I'm hopeful, as we all are, that uh, we are going to have more jobs in America, that we're going to have a higher standard of living for a great number of people beyond those who are living well now, that we're going to have better educational opportunities for all of our children so they really do have a fighting chance to get the jobs that pay well or to start new businesses or what have you. Um, but this is uh, going to take some time, and advocacy, and as a reference to the last question, it's going to require candidates to really speak out in a constructive way on these issues, as opposed to a wall uh, against Mexico or uh, leaving countries out of NATO if they don't pay their dues, or uh, wild suggestions of this variety, which really don't help the distressed Americans, but, but really simply demonstrate that uh, someone is prepared, really, to, to go after the entire leadership of the country. Uh, Senator, in 1986, I just come from India as an immigrant, and I saw you lead the fight to override President Reagan's veto of the Anti-Apartheid Act. I was so impressed when you said, in this case, I'm sorry, but the president is wrong. And I have been a big fan since. It was a great cause, and it actually saw the end of apartheid in South Africa. So I will always be grateful for that particular fight that you undertook. My question to you relates to the change in our democracy. I mean, how do we invite, you know, how do we change the tone so invite the best and the brightest to come to public service and to politics? Uh, that is the only way we can improve what's happening. How are we going to get next senators like you, Senator Nunn, and my big favorite, Senator Monaghan? whom actually George Will said that they should leave his seat open and never fill it again. And uh, so, uh, how do we do that? I think it's very important that um, this uh, yen to serve occur very early in life. It can occur through our church memberships. For example, I was active in the Methodist Youth Fellowship as a young person. And um, at Short Ridge High School, uh, I was an advocate for no smoking, no drinking, no sex, no, you know, that type of thing. <clears throat> uh, to say the least, I was not the most popular person. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, undeterred by this, uh, for, proceeded on to Denison University and finally won a, an election that was very important in my life, uh, to be co-president of the student body, the, uh, <clears throat> the co-president because Dennis was way ahead of the game then, had to be a woman, and there had to be a man and a woman, and a woman that was selected, uh, Charlene Smells from Detroit, I had known in philosophy class, but um, I got rumors that she said, I'm not gonna be pushed around by some pushy man. I said, me, no, surely not. Uh, but uh, diplomacy came to the fore. I took her downtown for a cup of coffee, and thus began a romance, and uh, <clears throat> we've been married for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a situation in which Shar was a very good politician. And um, I, I mention this because uh, both of us have been active. You, you cannot uh, really go out and try to save the world without having a husband or a wife who likewise believes in these things. And, and your children who are really prepared for all the negative advertising and all the difficulties that come. Again and again, um, as I visit with student bodies 
around the country. I encourage people to consider, really, public life, the sense, really, of running for election. But as they do so, to think through their ability to speak, their ability to write, their ability to have a marriage and a family that is going to be able to sustain them through the ups and downs of this situation, but who finally will, will find real joy in that service and in the achievements of it. And uh, I think there, there are lots of young people arising. Thank goodness many of them come to Washington or, or to the state capitals to be interns. They actually have experience in politics and deal with the voters and are on the phone and so forth. Uh, more and more of this needs to happen. I've been intrigued by the fact that, except for Iran, there's been very little mention of the Middle East. And one of the concerns I've heard about the Iran deal is that it may, um, with the lifting of sanctions and the improvement of its economy, that it may have an ability to negatively affect the stability. Well, there's not a lot of stability, but um, negatively affect vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, events in the Middle East. So I'd like your opinion on that. Well, all of those fears are potentially uh, there. And uh, Iran certainly has not been bashful in the work they've been doing, in, in not only behind the scenes, but in front of the scenes, with regard to the Syrian question and ISIS and other aspects of the Middle East. And um, well, likewise, to say the least, Israelis are not happy about the Iran deal. But uh, <clears throat> at the same time, Israelis have not come to the point that they wish to do a nuclear strike on Iran at this particular case and, and have some reciprocity of that. Um, they simply wish that without perhaps going through all the motions we've been going through, that Iran would give up the nuclear weapons, but that was unlikely. So we're, we're in a situation in the next 10 years uh, in which uh, hopefully Iran is going to develop as a nation uh, to have really more ties with um, other countries on a friendly basis as opposed to an adversary situation in the Middle East. And we're going to have to work at this uh, and diplomatically very hard. Uh, and I, I don't predict precisely what's going to happen by year 10 or year, year 15, but I think there is a reasonable chance uh, that uh, given the fact that we did have this large group of, of powerful nations that uh, were behind the Iran deal, that we can continue to pull them together and to keep talking to each other. And that's important in itself. The fact that I mentioned China and Russia as a part of this group means we've had some conversation with those countries. We don't have many conversations. The question is really how to open up communication with the Russians, and much more so with the Chinese. Um, and and I, I would say the Iran deal and how to deal with Iran, or maybe even the, the questions ultimately of how to deal with the problems of Pakistan and India. Uh, ideally, if we could get the Chinese interested in North Korea, which has been suggested tonight, this would be helpful, quite apart from the Russians. But these are things that uh, at least the Russians and the Chinese that I talk to with this nuclear threat initiative group uh, understand. They're willing to talk about it openly. And uh, so this gives me a little bit of optimism. Senator, you've reminded us of, of, of three very important principles around which I think um, uh, all of us here uh, can agree. One is the idea that talking to people uh, with whom you might disagree isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength and a sign of smarts. That we're, as a country, stronger and we're more prosperous, we're safer, and the world is a better place when we're engaged in the world yes, rather than retreating from it. And finally, that we do better, that we make better decisions when we work across the aisle and with people of both parties to develop solutions for our country. So we are very privileged to have had you in the Senate for 36 years, 
to continue to have you as a leader on the global stage representing the United States and for speaking so openly with all of us tonight. So please, everyone, thank you. join me. Thank you, Senator Thank you very much. Thank you.